the, the topic I'm going to present today, uh, it is the, a modeling study that I did uh, uh, for evaluating those mature oil fields for their uh, uh, carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery and storage potential. As you, have, uh, you are aware of uh, that, uh, this global climate summit going on in Paris and uh, there is a lot of emphasis on reducing the gas, green ga greenhouse gas emissions reduction and uh, so um, there is a lot of emphasis on finding the ways to reduce that uh, greenhouse gas emissions emissions and this is one of the things that uh, petroleum industry is doing forever in the in the form of uh, carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery and we can extend this uh, knowledge for co2 storage in subsurface formation and that's the that's the theme of this talk. Uh, so uh, the motivation I have already mentioned, what is my motivation uh, to, to use this uh, kind of analysis to find uh, uh, these uh, candidate reservoirs that we can use uh, for CO2 enhanced oil recovery and the storage both. And I'm going to present uh, some California specific uh, reservoir results uh, uh, in this uh, talk. And just to give you an idea about uh, uh, how su successful was this study, like um, one client, uh, uh, they came to us uh, like three, three years ago when I was there in North Dakota, that okay, we have a sales contract uh, with a uh, processing plant, and uh, we, they want, to, uh, they want a assurance that the company has enough pore space to store the CO2, and they wanted a very quick study. And you know, this uh, petroleum reservoir simulation, it takes years of study to, to build the model and do the simulation. And uh, so I did this study for them and rank the reservoir, and you would not believe that they bought that reservoir in $1.5 billion plus. They sold their all the Bakken, North Dakota asset to buy the field that I recommended and they are doing the CO2 EOR right now in Powder River Basin in Wyoming. So I'm going to present these results. Uh, so uh, in, when it comes to California, if you are aware, uh, California has the most strict uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction regulation on the planet. So they are pioneer in that, and uh, if you take a look here, in California, the CO2 emissions are the main uh, portion of that uh, total GHG emissions. Uh, and this is to 2012 data. And if you take a, the, uh, the look on the second uh, diagram here, around 37 or 33 percent of those emissions comes from stationary sources like electricity or power plants. So that's a different story if we can capture those CO2 from those stationary resources. So I leave that to you folks, chemical engineers, to find efficient ways to capture that CO2. But what if we have that CO2 captured from those stationary plants? We need a space to store that safely and securely for our long period of time. So in that regulatory environment, California is pushing a very strict uh, this uh, emission reduction goals and now they want to reduce their emissions 40% below 1990 level by 2030. And in that, this uh, carbon capture and storage, they have uh, uh, included it as an important option uh, because uh, oil industry is using this for, uh, for a long time. And, uh, to give you an idea about that, uh, there are around 113 uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery project in the in the in the USA right now, and uh, they are injecting they have they are injecting around 60 million metric tons of CO2 per year, but majority of that CO2 comes from natural resource uh, natural sources like CO2 storage uh, CO2 reservoirs natural CO2 reservoirs. But the emphasis is moving to anthropogenic uh, or industrial CO2. And in that process, actually, they leave a lot of CO2 behind in the reservoir. And uh, 
it is a commodity for, for the oil industry, so they don't want to leave that behind, but in that process, they leave a lot of CO2, and you can see they stored almost uh, 10 million metric tons of CO2, and I call it like incidental CO2 storage. They did not mean to store it, and uh, but it, it brings a, a good economic in, in incentive uh, to the industry, the storage or CCS industry in the sense, uh, I, I just read the article in the morning that uh, UK, they scraped one billion uh, pound funding for dedicated CO2 storage project, means they don't have any economic incentive to store the CO2 in underground if they are not producing anything out of that because it is costly, but if you do the CO2 EOR, in that process you leave a lot of CO2 in the, in the ground, but you are producing the oil. That's the idea here. And it is, if we look for the California, they have done in the past actually, when uh, there was the oil crisis uh, um, in the US, they started to look for using CO2 EOR for increasing the oil production. So they did a lot of, uh, uh, few, not a lot, uh, few uh, pilot projects. And in that pilot projects, actually, uh, uh, it was uh, from the field data. Uh, so if you, like, you can see, like, the hydrocarbon pore volume, that how much pore space is available. So they injected almost, in this particular case, they injected almost 40% uh, percent hydrocarbon pore volume. Uh, no, so they, sh they left around 40% or almost 50% of that total injected. Like they injected 80% uh, or 0 0.8 hydrocarbon power volume, but they just produced only 0.4. So they, lay they left a lot of CO2 behind in that process. So that was the incidental CO2 storage, and with these regulations, actually you can get a lot of carbon credit uh, for doing those things even though you don't want to leave CO2 behind. So uh, there is a lot of potential uh, in California. Uh, the lot of oil can be produced uh, uh, using that uh, CO2 EOR technologies. But the problem is that you want to know which candidate reservoirs you want to target first. So there are, uh, if you are not aware about California and geology, uh, this is the San Joaquin Basin uh, where majority of the oil produced in California, so Bakersfield, my university is somewhere here. So we are right there at the heart of that oil production. And uh, if you know that Bakersfield is one of the most polluted city in the US also. So there is a lot of emphasis from that point of view to clean the air in that uh, basin because uh, this whole area is surrounded with this mountain range, so it is valley. Uh, there is a lot of pollution problem there. So uh, there is a push to use this CO2 EOR. And, uh, and if you say here, there are a lot of power plants, stationary power sources here. So there's a good environment for ut utilizing this technology. So for that, there are uh, some studies done by uh, some researchers in the past about uh, finding the good candidate reservoirs. And, but these studies are limited to very initial, like equation-based calculations. So then I started to look uh, further if I can use this, uh, this CO2 EOR profit uh, model that industry use uh, for EOR purposes, but not for storage purposes. There's the twist here. So this is just a, a uh, cross-section, geology cross-section of the valley. There are a lot of uh, oil uh, reservoir. Those are deposited like a pockets in a deep, uh, thick shale uh, formation. So those are good candidate for storage purposes. So uh, continuing that kind of analysis, uh, I targeted some of the, uh, the fields. Those are in uh, uh, the sand called Stephen Sand. Just to give you an idea, it is an isolated sand. It produces a lot of oil. But you can see it is, it is encased in a thick shale uh, formation that helps uh, like a cap rock. So it is a good storage or sealing container. 
So for the for the sand, I used this uh, profit model that was developed in 90s by Texaco, but nobody has used before me for using this uh, uh, or utilizing this tool for estimating the CO2 storage or storage potential. And what do I mean by storage potential? I just uh, look for uh, the amount of CO2 that I injected in the model and how much CO2 I produce. So I took a simple difference of those two and calculated uh, how much CO2 I left in the reservoir. And the beauty of this profit model is that uh, it is very robust model and people have done some uh, comparison with the sophisticated simulation tool uh, where you need a lot of data, a lot of time, and this kind of uh, profit model can uh, give you a reasonable results within very short period of time. So, but to rely on my simulation or modeling results, I need to make sure that I calibrate my model. So uh, you can calibrate this model uh, for a kind of material balance in the sense uh, how much water you produce, like a water cut, and how much oil you produce. So you are calibrating your model for those two phases, like material balance. And you can see here, is a, like by changing the input parameters, I was able to get a good calibration. And the this area, I, you cannot match because they put a lot of valves that I cannot simulate in the model. So anyway, but overall it was a good fit and I used that. And what data did I use? Uh, uh, there was very limited data that you need and I think you have seen this uh, minimum miscibility pressure. So CO2 is a good solvent, uh, it dissolved the oil, but you need to inject at a particular pressure that it is miscible uh, in all proportion from a chemical engineering point of view. So, uh, so I looked for those reservoirs in Stevens Sand and started to calibrate my model. I for reservoir X, I calibrated the model. And <clears throat> for the boy, uh, there was limited history, water flooding history, but whatever data I had, I tried to match kind of a average uh, matching. And then I used those to predict some scenarios and uh, what was those scenarios I used, okay, if I just inject uh, miscible CO2 without any water uh, stream, because oil industry has used uh, CO2 with water, they call it water alternating gas, where they want to reduce the volume of CO2 injected because it was a commodity. So I looked for both and uh, I stopped my simulation at one hydrocarbon per volume and uh, calculated the uh, incidental CO2 storage and the software was written in 90s, so it was not user friendly. So I asked one of my student to develop a macro so that I can, I can read the results from the, the text file. He did a good job on that and made my life a little easier so that I could get the results quickly. And you can see here, it is a very similar uh, trend uh, that I showed you earlier from the field data. Uh, this is red one is the injected and uh, the blue one is produced. So you can see that you injected almost one hydrocarbon per volume, but you just produce almost 0.5. So you are leaving almost half of the injected CO2 in the reservoir. In the same, uh, so if I convert those numbers how much oil I'm producing. So I can get in, in, in this particular reservoir, um, uh, I look for one million metric ton CO2 injection per year. That is the definition for commercial CO2 injection project. Uh, so I was able to get almost like 20% and so uh, like oil recovery. And that's a pretty good number. Uh, normally you get 15 to 18% in the field. And during the process I was able to store almost 30% uh, like uh, almost I injected almost 40 million metric ton uh, or 34 million metric ton for 34 years but I was able to leave behind almost 12 million metric ton CO2 and in the same uh, for reservoir Y the results were more encouraging so for one hydrocarbon per volume uh, again almost uh, 
only 1.1 per volume CO2 was produced. So there were a lot of CO2 left behind in this, in this reservoir. So if I transfer that, I was able to produce a lot of oil, almost 40%. That is a little higher side, but if you take a look on the history here, actually uh, they have produced a significant amount of oil with the primary recovery. So it is a very nice reservoir, so it can produce that much of oil with CO2 injection and you can leave again around 12 million metric ton of CO2 over a period of 25 years. So you, 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 you do a good job uh, if you have this kind of reservoir, you produce a lot of oil, but uh, the, from uh, regulation point of view, uh, you are bringing dirty oil again onto the surface and burning it, you are producing more CO2 compared to what you are leaving behind. So the, the counter argument would be, I don't have any other economic driver to make my pure CO2 storage project successful. Uh, so I will, I will, I will uh, give my opinion on that in a minute, let me summarize this. So uh, both the reservoir that I uh, studied uh, in California, they are a good candidate. Those are top candidate actually. They can uh, take almost 1 million metric tons CO2 per year. And uh, you can do in both like uh, continuous CO2, miscible CO2, or if you, if you don't want to put a lot of CO2, you can use WAG, water alternating gas. And the, the motivation or the objective of doing this kind of modeling is to make a management decision, okay, which reservoir I want to, to choose for further simulation studies. Then it will take two years, three years to complete, but I can ac actually rank and identify my reservoirs using this methodology and would not spend my time on a bad reservoir but uh, now, as we are moving towards more regulatory environment, people like California don't want to, to use fossil fuel anymore. So what I'm uh, pushing for that, okay, we are facing the drought in California. So what if, if I start to use CO2 injection as a drive mechanism to produce the water from the subsurface formations? So I can leave the CO2 behind, but I can produce water uh, using that pressure. And obviously there would be a lot of uh, uh, chemical engineering uh, for cleaning that water when it is on the surface. So, but you can do it in both ways. And uh, um, I think we are moving in right direction in California. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, if you have any question, uh, yeah.